Hello, everybody, and welcome to CS441-541 Artificial Intelligence. I'm Bart Massey, and I'll be your instructor in this adventure. And hopefully we're going to have big fun this quarter learning about the basics of AI and then going on to learn about classical AI. First of all, I want to say that I hope you're doing well and staying safe in this very, very difficult time. My heart goes out to you if you're having any of the many difficulties of this difficult year. And the second thing I should say is that this video in particular is going to be a little longer than I'd like because I couldn't find a convenient place to break it. So please, please, uh, Feel free, if you get tired or bored, to push the pause on your player and come back to it later. It's one of the nice things about recorded content is that you have control over how it's played back. So like I say, I'm Bart Massey. I have a doctorate in artificial intelligence, specializing in a peculiar kind of classical AI that I'll talk about throughout the course. I, Machine learning is not my area of specialization, which makes me an anomaly in AI these days. Uh, I've been an instructor for 20 years and a software developer for close to twice that. So I hope that I'm going to be able to help you figure out what's going on. I'm looking forward to working with you on this. So with that said, let's go ahead and just dive into the material. But we're going to be talking about today. And that is to sort of just think a little bit about the basics of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is one of those topics that's so in the news lately that a lot of silly things have been said about it and a lot of impactful things have been said about it and it's just everywhere and something people think about all the time and to some extent the job of an introductory AI class is to make sense out of all that and put you on the right direction so that you can sort of understand from the perspective of an AI researcher even if you're not yet yourself an AI researcher what's going on around you when people talk and think about AI so Let's start with games. Games are something that the field of artificial intelligence has always been interested in, and they're something that I, in particular, have always been interested in as a way of thinking about computers thinking and just as a fun thing to mess with. In particular, I'm kind of interested in Yahtzee, and if you've never seen Yahtzee before, I would encourage you to pause the video, click the links in the notes, and explore it a little bit. That's one of the luxuries we have here. It's for video game journalists, see Yahtzee Krasha. I have, I have. Um, it's a dice game. It's a dice game with some luck and some skill where you try to fill in a board to make the highest score. It can be played by yourself or with others. I also have a link in the notes to a site on which you can play it and try it out if you want. So we have this little game that is about probabilities and dice and how you can try to roll the dice to get an optimal outcome. And it feels, after playing it a little bit, like the kind of thing where some intelligence is required, but not too much. I built a single player solver for this game. I'm not unique in that regard, but I'm one of the people, one of a few people who've built a, a game, a thing that can play perfect Yahtzee, uh, single player Yahtzee for various definitions of perfect that you might choose. And that's what's whole on can of worms. That's interesting, but to me, the interesting thing story for, from the point of view of this class is why I built ended up building a perfect Yahtzee player because what I started with is thinking about how humans play Yahtzee. When I was learning to program in Java back when Java was a new thing because I'm that old, I built a little Yahtzee game, you know, a little single player Yahtzee game where you played against, you know, and then I wanted to be able to play against the computer 
in a two-player game, so I needed to build a computer Yahtzee player. And so I spent a few hours thinking about how I played Yahtzee and wrote down some really simple heuristic rules, some sort of simple rules for how a computer could play Yahtzee that looked recognizably like Yahtzee. And I built that into my little Java program and it consistently beat me at Yahtzee. And I'm like, that's not okay. Cause you know, I, I wrote these rules. I'm supposed to be able to play them. It's, it shouldn't, I shouldn't be able to be beaten by rules I figured out myself. And at that point I got really cranky and rather than do the smart thing and just admit that I'm a bad Yahtzee player, I said, well, what does it mean to, you know, what would it take to beat these heuristics? What's the next thing down that road? And ended up being able to build a single player solver for the game. So there's two interesting questions. One is the one I thought about when I built those heuristics. How do humans play Yahtzee? How, you know, how is it that they do play Yahtzee? And you know, for me, I'd learned some sort of rules of thumb for in various situations, this is what you do in the game of Yahtzee. But maybe the more interesting question, and the one that I haven't explored very much, is how do humans learn to play Yahtzee? How do, you know, somebody teaches you the rules of the game, how do I get good? How do I become a strong Yahtzee player? And I think that's a super interesting question, and it's the kind of question that AI researchers engage in really hard. Another game I've played with is a game called Shut the Box. Shut the Box is another game that, you know, if you're not familiar with it, go ahead and click on these links and check it out a little bit. But it's another simple multiplayer probabilistic dice game like Yahtzee. It can be played with one to infinity players. Um, and I've built a single player solver for that game as well. It's a different game in feel because the dice are handled differently, luck is handled differently, but still they're very related games. One is, you know, roll dice and try to fill in a board. The other one is sort of roll dice and try to fill in at the board. So the highest level, they're the same thing. And so sort of the same questions apply. How do humans play Shut the Box? How do humans play, uh, you know, and ha then the other obvious question is, what does this have in common with Yahtzee? You'd think that a program, a computer program that I wrote to play perfect Yahtzee, I didn't need to write one for Shut the Box. I'd just have it do that game instead. You know, my Yahtzee program would just do that game instead. Now nah, it turns out they're two completely different programs that I really had to write each one from the ground up. And that's kind of one of the interesting questions of AI is can we build these artificial general intelligences, these AIs that aren't just tied to a very specific narrow task. And you know, most of my AI career has been building AIs that are tied to a specific narrow task, but uh, maybe you know, we can do better. And that's a lot of what AI is about. If you don't wanna think about games, maybe you wanna think about animals. Because while I think there's little question, maybe not zero question, but little, that humans are the smartest thing we've ever encountered for some definition of smart that we'll defer to later. Yeah, chimpanzees we think of as smart, and it turns out octopuses are surprisingly smart. And so what's the difference, right? Why, why are we not studying them to understand intelligence? You know, one of the interesting problems of artificial intelligence is a lot of people, their first thing they think is, oh, you know, we want to build systems with human level thinking or maybe superhuman level thinking. You know, we can't build an AI that's a very smart, you know, that's as smart as a dog. We can sort of build an AI that's as smart as a flatworm, maybe. I mean, we are not, you know, we're, if there's any kind of continuum here, we are not very far along that continuum. So, when I say chimps are smart, what do I mean by that? Well, here's an interesting video you can watch where a chimpanzee is trying to, uh, trying to get a prize out of a tube. So there's this plastic tube and sitting in the middle is a prize right over here. And sorry, I should make this bigger just a second sitting in the middle is a prize right over here and the chimpanzee has a stick and can stick it in the end of the tube but if it sticks it in the wrong end 
it will push it into that trap right there. But if it pushes it, sticks it in the right end, then it, it can push it out of the tube. And so the chimpanzee here has figured out maybe that if it pushes it out the long end, it's in good shape. But a lot of times the chimpanzee still manages to get the thing stuck in the trap. Um, humans, you know, are not that, I think. So there's a lot of sort of that kind of thing where, you know, you think they're pretty smart and then you watch them try tasks of basic intelligence. Uh, like I say, octopuses are also interesting. One of the other things I'd like to have you read at some point is this nice article on octopus intelligence uh, because the octopuses are uh, very bright creatures and yet they're very alien creatures and so they make a really interesting case study. You know, we might ask ourselves, well, <laughs> You know, this seat feels like it ought to be relevant to artificial intelligence. It feels like something that we should be caring about when we care about uh, AI, but it's hard to know how to put this kind of stuff to use. It's hard to think about how to think about it. Another way to think about AI is in terms of language. We are the creatures of much fancy language and so maybe language is a key idea at the center of artificial intelligence, maybe. And so that's something that people have been thinking about for a long time too, as you all know, uh, conversational AI, sort of can you build a machine that has a conversation? Very famously, there's the Turing test, and I would encourage you to all read both the Turing test article on Wikipedia that I've linked and Turing's actual paper, which is just right out there. You can just read it on the Turing test because it's an interesting and complicated idea. If you're not aware of it at all, the idea here is that we have computers try to imitate human conversation, to carry on their side of a conversation in such a way that humans can't tell that it's a computer on the other end. And Turing, or Alan Turing, the famous... Uh, well, computer science founder, argued that if the computer really can do that, then that's sufficient proof that you've got an intelligent computer going. And that's an attractive idea. There's a lot more to the Turing test than that. And again, I'd encourage you to read about it. It's an attractive idea. Somebody named Loebner started the Loebner Prize competition a while ago. And the idea of the Loebner Prize competition is every year they give out a prize to the computer program that comes the closest to passing the Turing test in the estimation of judges. There's a process. And what we've found is that the Loebner Prize has produced some really, really convincing conversational computers. And yet, when you look at the conversational computers software, you don't see anything that looks very smart. Basically, the Loebner Prize winners have tended to be giant bags of tricks that use all kinds of psychological tricks to keep you from noticing that they really don't have intelligent things to say. And so that's a little disturbing for the Turing test because it casts doubt on Turing's question, you know, proposition. Turing's proposition was, well, if it can talk like a person, it's a person. Turns out maybe that's giving people too much credit. <laughs> so yeah, you know, is an inhuman intelligence an intelligence, right? Some people would argue that, yeah, there's no such thing as an intelligent thing that thinks completely different than a person. And once you go down that road, you end up very rapidly in the space of definitions. Well, what's the definition of intelligent and what should that look like? Um, so, yeah, uh, Chris, the late Christopher Strachey, one of, another of the founding computer scientists, said that ar defined artificial intelligence as the domain of the artificial intelligentsia, and that cuts a little, but it's not entirely unfair. You know, we have two things to unstack here, intelligent, which we've talked about a little bit, and sort of artificial intelligent, well, 
does artificial add anything, right? Um, maybe calling this artificial intelligence is kind of pointless. Maybe we're just trying to understand intelligence. But computer intelligence is presumably what we'll spend the next 10 weeks on because we're all computer peoples here. And so maybe that's why we say AI. So here's some definitions of AI that I've seen around and liked to some degree. You know, maybe it's thinking and acting like a human. And this is the most common one, right? Well, you know, AI is what robots have. You know, there again, octopuses, chimpanzees, being able to play games well. You know, how much is the humanness of the things we build tied into necessary for them to be intelligent? You know, I like reaching intellectual goals in the presence of, or achieving intellectual goals in the presence of intellectual obstacles. So if we accept that there's such a thing as a space of the mind, if you know you have some goal um, that's sort of a mental goal, this is what I need to figure out or understand or you know do mentally, and there's stuff keeping me from doing that and I can do it anyway, maybe that means I'm intelligent. And that allows for a lot narrower systems. It's a lot tighter, narrower definition of artificial intelligence. And it means that we have a lot more kinds of things we can study to understand how intelligence could work. My doctoral work was mostly about solving practical instances of problems that are sort of computationally generally intractable. So we take some NP hard problem like finding an optimal schedule or finding an, finding a plan to achieve some goal or you know, coloring a map with four colors or whatever it is that we need to do that's NP hard. And we build programs that do very well at solving, you know, reasonable sized instances of those, often very, very much better than any human being. So to some extent in this very limited narrow domain of coloring maps with colors, we have superhuman intelligence. I've built them myself. Uh, you know, there's a fine line between an intelligence and an algorithm. And that's a line we're gonna explore in detail for the next while. And another one of my favorite definitions, very tongue in cheek. Oh yeah, AI is the set of things that a human can do that a computer can't yet. The implication there being that, you know, when a human can, when a computer can do it, then we just write it off as AI. So the classic example here is chess, right? You know, everybody said, oh man, chess is hard. Chess is a one of the premier human intellectual activities. If you could build a computer that could play chess, <laughs> well, then you'd have something. And some 50 years of effort later, well, heck, we have computers that routinely have computers that routinely beat the best players in the world. I don't think there's any question that the world human computer chess champion at this point in 2020 is a computer. And so what's been the result? Yay, we've achieved AI. No, no, no. We said, well, chess, that's not really, you know, that programs that play chess aren't artificial intelligences. No, no, they're just computer programs. <laughs> so that's a thing too, is sort of moving the goalposts. So what are some of the issues in AI that we think about you know, another way to sort of look at this is sort of operationally and the things that the traditional AI research community looks at are things like how are problems represented? How is knowledge represented? So sort of setting the ground in which problems are posed and studied is a big part of intelligence. And we think a lot about that. We think a lot about the constraints of memory and computational time, right? We think a lot about, well, if we're going to build specifically computer intelligences, what does that imply about what we need for computers and how do we use those computers efficiently in time and space to solve big problems? And as if I've been implying for the last 20 minutes, you know, a lot of this is how do I evaluate it? How do I validate the result? How do I argue that the thing I've built is an intelligent system? What kinds of things am I looking for? And we'll be thinking about all of these questions as we go. Another way to define AI is sort of the thing AI researchers do. I mean, this is always a legitimate way to define a field is by what the researchers in the field consider the field. So if you go through the proceedings of the latest national conference for artificial intelligence or the proceedings of the latest international joint conference for artificial intelligence, 
these are some of the areas of study that you'll find papers on in those proceedings. Uh, knowledge representation and reasoning, like I said before, sort of heuristic and rule-based systems. How do I build simple systems that build intelligent behavior? Something called state space search, which we'll spend a lot of time on, partly because it's really foundational to AI and partly because, like I say, it was my area of doctoral research. So single agent search, that is solving things like puzzles where you're it's you versus nature. And we'll talk about complete search, local search, constraint satisfaction as techniques for uh, doing single agent search. We'll also talk about adversary search, which is you versus another human being. You know, how do chess programs work? We'll look at that at least a little bit. Uh, planning and scheduling is another area of state space search that's really important. And that's actually specifically what my doctorate, my doctoral dissertation was about was planning. Machine learning is a big deal, and I want to be really clear that it's an important part, if not the important part of AI right now, absolutely, but I also want to make it really clear that while we will talk about the basics of machine learning in this course, we will look at neural nets, we will look at genetic algorithms, we will look at you know all other kinds of machine learners that people don't study so much anymore. Having said that, they're not going to be the focus of this course. This is what's called a classical AI course, and we're going to pay more attention to the other stuff. PSU has fantastic courses specifically in machine learning, and the idea of this course is to prepare you to take those if you're interested in studying machine learning. So that systems inspired by nature, that includes things like neural nets, but it includes all kinds of other interesting systems, ant colonies and that kind of stuff. And so uh, that's a thing you'll see articles about. Uh, applications of AI are a big deal. So, you know, this idea that sort of we study AI for its own sake is not very well represented in the actual artificial intelligence literature. If you go look at it, a lot of it is either directly practical applications. So the National Conference on Artificial Intelligence has a whole subconference devoted to practical applications of artificial intelligence. It's its whole own thing. But also, even the papers that are sort of theory of AI are really trying to solve problems people care about for the most part in their own right. Is there a philosophy? Not in a typical mainstream AI conference, not so much. They have their own set of conferences, and I don't know much about that. That's definitely not a thing that we're going to be doing much of in here. I know that you may have come to this course because you wanted to understand sort of the grand vision of where AI fits philosophically into, you know, theories of the universe and human knowledge and understanding. I don't know that. I don't know how to teach you that. This is a computer science course. And while that's an absolutely respectable pursuit, it's not much going to happen here. I thought the movie of a few years ago, Ex Machina, was a good movie to look at to think about some of those philosophy questions, but partly because it provided a good tie to uh, very practical questions um, about, you know, sort of how artificial intelligence are built. So last thing I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, how do you study AI? Because it's the same as you study everything else in some ways, but it's also a little special. The fact of the matter is that while AI is a surprisingly accessible discipline for newcomers, really to get good at it takes a lot of years of poking at it now. It took less when I started. I've been at this a long time. And these days enough is built up that there's a lot to do. And here's what I would suggest if you really want to do more than just pass the class, which isn't all that high a bar, and get the much higher bar of actually understanding, starting to really understand AI, go grab things to read. And even if they aren't assignments, grab them and read them anyway. You know, grab the latest proceedings of the National Conference on Artificial Intelligence, confusingly called Triple AI and uh, skim it, look at it, see if there are interesting papers and read them. Um, find a good tutorial book in an area that you're interested in. And I guess I know that's probably machine learning, but whatever your areas are, or just find a good tutorial book on the basis of artificial intelligence. Our textbook's quite good and you know, read that for sure. Build things that aren't even assignments, right? So 
you know, AI is one of these things where you can do what I did with the Yahtzee program I started out at the beginning of this talk with. You can say, well, I need a machine player, let's build one, and I'll build it the dumbest possible way I know how and see what it looks like, right? One of the interesting things about AI is everybody sort of assumes that it's hard because it's hard to find solutions to your problems. And my experience of AI over a long period of time has been the exact opposite. The problem is that when you think about a problem that requires an intelligent solution, a million solutions immediately suggest themselves, a million things you could try. And developing an intuition for which ones are likely to work, which ones you should try first to get something working in a reasonable amount of time, that's a really important skill. And I don't know how to, you learn it better than just by practicing on problems. Find a problem, try to build an intelligent solution. What worked, what didn't? You know, when it doesn't work, build a different solution. Did that one work better? Um, you know, what were you surprised by? And the other thing is that, you know, like I said, AI isn't really philosophy. At the end of the day, if you're good at building systems and evaluating systems you've built, you know, that's really important. And that's get interact and interlock really hard with the AI stuff. The last thing I'd advise you to do is look, this is a very general broad course. We're gonna to try to survey very, very fast a whole bunch of material. Trying to start with general AI is just, if, if ever, you know, not now, not at the beginning of your AI career. Pick a technology, pick a domain, and focus on that, right? Pick some area where AI might be applicable that you're interested in and learn how AI is being used and learn how you might use different stuff, right? Pick a particular kind of AI. Yes, I know it will be machine learning, you know, but whatever it is, for me, it was state-space search. Specialize in that and really understand the field to a deep degree. That kind of specialization will really pay off, especially when you're getting started. So that's what we're up to here. I hope this talk was useful. I hope you're gonna stay safe and well out there. I, you know, like I say, I wish you the best in these difficult times. Thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again, and I will talk to you again soon. Take care.